Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Lin Zhang, uh, the keynote speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Zhang is an associate professor of communication at the University of New Hampshire. Her research centers on critical innovation studies, platform studies, and intersectionality, focusing on China and ethnic Asian people in a global and a comparative context. A communication scholar by training, uh, Dr. Zhang's uh, research, interdisciplinary research, engages Asian, Asian American studies, science and technology studies, also known as STS, economic geography, and anthropology. She's the author of The Labor of Reinvention, Entrepreneurship in the New Chinese Digital Economy, published by Columbia University Press in 2023. Highly recommended. I signed, uh, uh, I signed two chapters to my students and uh, that led to a lot of uh, aha moments. Um, building on her first book, she's currently working on two new projects. One revolves around China's biotech industry and the US-China transnational linkages in biotech and bioscience. The other documents the ongoing restructuring of rural China and agriculture through digital media and other new technologies. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Zhang. Over to you. Thank you, Jing, for the generous introduction. So it's such an honor and pleasure for me to uh, share my work here at NYU Shanghai and also the fifth uh, Young Scholar Symposium. I'm especially grateful prof uh, to Professor Wang Jing and also Professor Tenzin Sen um, and the Center for Global Asia for the invitation and uh, opportunity. I would also like to thank Asian Research Center of Fudan University for co-sponsoring this event and my talk. Um, and then finally, thank you, the audience, for uh, coming here to hear me talk and engage me with my work. Um, I really look forward to our, uh, of, uh, to our conversation um, after uh, you know, doing the Q&A. So um, the talk, as uh, Jing mentioned, will revolve around my uh, new monograph, The Labor of Reinvention, uh, Entrepreneurship in the New Chinese Digital Economy, uh, which was published last year by Columbia University Press. Also in conjuncture with the theme of our symposium this year, Asia and the World, um, I will use um, um, the uh, stories that I told in the book about um, Taobao villages to discuss the concept of uh, what I call the China paradigm and to elaborate on the question of how to kind of position the Chinese experiences globally. So let me start from the very beginning of my journey of writing this book. Um, the inspiration actually first came to me in 2011, um, more than a decade ago now, on um, a bus trip um, to uh, visit my uncle's family in rural China. So that fateful summer, riding through the countryside on an intercity bus, I saw something unexpected at that time. Now it's very commonplace. Um, multiple advertisements for the e-commerce platform Taobao, all targeting peasants. And two of ads actually stood out to me in particular. One said, want a better life? Why not come home and work on Taobao? And the other said, um, a cup of coffee and an internet um, cable, stay at home, become an e-commerce entrepreneur, and your millionaire dream will come true. So when I saw this, I was talking to myself, uh, who doesn't want a job like that, right? Um, my cousin, who is a former migrant uh, factory worker in his early 30s, had apparently reached the same conclusion. So not long after my arrival, I learned that he had recently kind of reinvented himself as an e-commerce entrepreneur. Over dinner, he uh, explained that he decided not to return to his old factory after the year's spring festival holiday. After more than uh, spending more than a decade bloating in the city, um, the birth of his second daughter finally um, convinced him that it was time to start anew, and this time closer to home. 
At a middle school reunion party, he had learned from a former classmate about a new business opportunity here, selling small and hand braided furniture items and comb decorations online. And after um, making a trip to W Village, which is the same village uh, actually featured in the Taobao ads I passed on, I passed by on the bus. Some, he did some, some, some online research and also had a long conversation with his family. And he finally tapped into their savings, the whole family saving to set up a Taobao store. So um, my cousin's experience as an entrepreneur, however, suggested that the billboard's promises, if not false, were at least greatly exaggerated as we could imagine. Though life was more comfortable than they had been on the factory line, he was far from becoming a millionaire. It took him actually four months to recover his startup cost. And six months into his entrepreneurial adventure, his monthly um, revenues were barely topping his wages as a factory worker. And it turns out that um, a successful e-commerce venture requires more than just an internet cable and a cup of coffee. He had to learn how to set up a design and brand his online shop not to mention the more complicated tasks like product sourcing, storaging, packaging, mailing, and dealing with um, local home-based weavers, which um, who I, I would introduce very soon. So during my stay, I found that um, his time was packed with chores like taking product pictures, uh, talking to buyers on the internet over the phone, and also analyze his sales statistics. His workday actually extended well into the evening as he watched online tutorials taught by e-commerce gurus and took classes to hone his design skills, considering that he didn't have a lot of prior background in this. So um, my cousin was not, you know, the, the venture is not just a one-man operation. His home, um, you know, had been transformed into an e-commerce workshop with the bedroom doubling as a makeshift photo studio and the living room cluttered with handicrafts. The whole extended family was involved. My cousin's wife helped with customer service while taking care of their two small kids. My uncle chipped in by packaging and shipping products. And my um, aunt had taken charge of you know, cooking um, and other household chores, um, um, and and you know, um, and this this was done all uh, on top of tending um, the family's small wheat plot. So over the ensuing decades, um, as you can imagine, my cousin' life would take numerous twists and turns. Uh, his family e-commerce business boomed actually between 2011 and 13, a time that was generally acknowledged by my informants in W Village and other um, Taobao villages I visited over the years as a golden age of rural e-commerce in China. And starting in 2000, early 2014, um, his revenue began to drop as wave of rural entrepreneurs answered to the government call for uh, uh, quote unquote mass entrepreneurship and innovation. And when I last visited families um, in, in, in the summer of 2019, fierce competition has so eat, in, eaten into their profits that my cousin-in-law had taken a part-time job as a waitress near, in a nearby town just to make ends meet. So uh, my cousin uh, was not alone in his desire to reinvent himself, as you know, we can see there, um, just to fit into the new global economy. And since the 1990s, cultivating entrepreneurship had been hailed as the universal path to empowerment, a kind of silver bullet to a whole host of individual and collective ills. And the resulting worldwide cult of entrepreneurialism is pushing individuals and nations alike to become more enterprising by reinventing themselves in profitable new ways. But as um, my cousin's story suggests, um, the fervor underlying the code of entrepreneurialism and its attendant imperatives to personal and collective reinvention are conceding what I call the actually existing experiences of life beneath uh, this kind of ideological euphoria. And the years following the 2000 um, financial crisis um, represents, uh, I think, a paradoxical moment in the history of the global neoliberal order. Despite uh, the unprecedented proliferation of anti-entrepreneurialism around the world, there is also a growing awareness of the limits of entrepreneurialism, and along with it, mounting popular demand for stronger po social programs and structural changes to um, the economy. 
So um, this book, um, as you'll see the structure here, examines everyday labor of entrepreneurial reinvention and focusing on China's economic and social restructuring following the 2008 global economic crisis. After, after which we all know that the country heavily promoted mass entrepreneurship and innovation, especially in tech. And from the 2010s and 2000, 2010s uh, to the to, late 2010s, actually, I traveled back and forth between the US and China, explored the transnational linkages in entrepreneurship and journeyed extensively throughout China's um, you know, growing urban centers and also changing countryside. So in the book, uh, as you can see here, I focus on three groups of entrepreneurs intersectionally positioned with respect to class, gender, locale, and age. And this wide angle approach um, uh, definitely pr permits a better view of China's surging entrepreneurialism. At the state, the market and individuals search for kind of alternatives to the um, previous uh, un unsustainable national development model against the backdrop of global financial crisis, and uh, later on the US technology and trade war, US China technology trade and war, and also the COVID 19 pandemic more recently. And instead of a radical break with the past, I found that the labor of entrepreneur reinvention in China involves a kind of re-articulating global technological and economic shifts with existing uh, regime of production and systems of meaning. It blends elements of global trend towards labor individualization that we all feel as individuals um, with the kind of culturally specific practice of self-making and also nation building which um, I argue has opened up new opportunities for innovation while also giving rise to new precarities, contradictions, and inequalities. So the goal of this book is to kind of demystify entrepreneurialism by locating the source of capital's increased profits in the new regime of labor and changing production relations. So this actually, you can see here, puts me in conversation with more than two decades of scholarship about flexible digital and cultural labor under neoliberal capitalism since the 70s. And despite enormous contributions, um, this scholarship focuses on, uh, more on white middle-class workers in Western metropolitan centers like Silicon Valley and Silicon Alley. And mo more recently, the rise of kind of transnational digital platforms uh, around the world has fueled uh, studies of platform-based um, gig workers and network and sometimes quote-unquote placeless individuals um, sort of disembedded from the larger social economic context in which they're situated. So to complicate um, this existing literature on digital and cultural labor, have tried to um, theorize the global entrepreneurialization of labor as a dynamic process of what I call here reinvention. And this underlies its heterogeneous configurations, um, continuities, and rupture, ruptures from earlier regimes' work, its local embeddedness, and also its uh, cont contentious and contradictory nature. And in doing so, I have drawn extensively from the abundant scholarship produced on China and other emerging and non-Western economies. So instead of treating Socialist China as a kind of a negative case, a negative case compared to the capitalist free market ideal, or attributing China's post mao success solely to its adoption of market mechanisms, have um, expanded the work of scholars who recognize the kind of past dependency of China's traditional socialist and post mao developmental models and their institutional legacies and constraints, I argue, have produced a kind of contested but also fragmented polity in a state of constant evolution. So China's economic success over the past three decades has um, definitely led some scholars to search for a quote unquote China model, particularly during the years I would say following 2000 global, uh, 2008 global financial crisis. I share their concerns about cultural specificities and historical continuities and agree that China's experience offers important lessons about how capitalism and also you know, socialism has been organized historically and at the current conjuncture. However, I also reject the notion of Chinese essentialism and exceptionalism, and instead try to explore the kind of syncretism, intersectionalities, inequalities, and contradictions in, uh, involved in the uh, labor of entrepreneur reinvention. So um, as we all know that you know, when the book near completion, when I was you know, 
intensively writing it up um, in, my, in my study, uh, the US-China bilateral relationship went into free fall and China's emerging technological strengths became a kind of target for American sanctions and containment amid um, uh, unfolding technology and trade war, a topic that's actually also examined in these pages, but it's not the focus of today's presentation, uh, mostly in the first two chapters. So since then, enthusiasm about the China model kind of subsided and the conversation turned to concerns over um, the China threat. Um, so the idealized version of the China model once um, perhaps helps observers imagine alternatives to the current unipolar world order. And now reductionist framing of the China threat may well contribute, at least in the short term, to the unification of an otherwise divided American society against a foreign enemy. And either way, I believe it is actually more productive to overcome the kind, this kind of categorical formalism of both the China model versus the China threat. And instead to, um, to speak of a China paradigm, which is a term, uh, a phrase that I borrowed from the late historian uh, Arif Der uh, Derlich. So the Chinese experience is not a finished project to be emulated universally, but rather a work in progress. An ongoing experiment in how global principles articulate to historical circumstances and local reality in the process of nation building. And this means uh, in you know, um, historical and ethnographic research, focusing not only on successes and potentialities, but also on limitations and mistakes, not only on those who have benefited, but also on those who lost out. It is, um, I hope, to see and depict China for what it is in all these complexities and contradictions. So now that I've kind of mapped out my approach to understanding entrepreneur labor and China, let's zoom in um, on one of my major field sites in the book, uh, the e-commerce village in W uh, in Shandong province, to tell a concrete story of how this um, kind of um, tech innovation and entrepreneurship centered reinvention has happened on the ground in rural China and uh, how it uh, sort of shaped the lived experience of variously positioned entrepreneurial workers. And for that purpose, I'll whip together two chapters from the book and also a few of my recent published works. So a little bit of history here. Uh, the village of W is located in Northeast China's Yellow River um, Delta region. And due to geographic location, handicraft production in W actually dates back to 7th century BCE. And after People's Republic uh, was founded in 1949, handicraft making became an industry under local government supervision, mainly to earn foreign currency to support urban industrialization. So um, the kind of handicraft production didn't stall during uh, even like the years of Cultural Revolution. And since the reform and opening up um, of the 80s, handicraft export has expanded rapidly, feeding in the demand for low price um, handmade products from more than 20 countries around the world. Right? So it's turned into kind of an export oriented industry. As this industry um, a production chain matured, Peace Street weaving work was outsourced to women weavers in riverbank villages like W. And men in W were uh, actually giving up farming and migrating to cities to work in factories or on construction sites. Most women, because of this uh, kind of trade, stayed at home to work as weavers for um, private handicraft export form, uh, firms in addition to farming and domestic responsibilities. So they actually combined that with kind of care taking reproductive labor. Um, like elsewhere in China, this urban rural um, dual structure economy kind of decoupled urban productive labor from rural reproductive labor, resulting in a particular mode of a, a kind of a semi proletarianization that uh, rendered post Mao China's path of industrialization distinct. And the global economic crisis in 2008 disrupted this order. Handicraft export contracted as overseas demand weakened. Export-driven private businesses was also uh, becoming less profitable. But the substantial loss of urban jobs uh, drove many migrant workers uh, back home, which is also a trend that you know, we, we continue to witness until today with the new kind of rising use on employment here. Some who had learned to use computers and internet found alternative opportunities in selling handicrafts online. Uh, 
And since 2008, the virtual economy of handicraft e-commerce targeting urban China's growing middle class has gradually marginalized offline export-oriented firms in W. So um, export is not a major kind of production uh, now. It's, it's more domestic driven. Um, back in 2008, um, so the e-commerce hype took off uh, with um, the return of a few young entrepreneurial urban migrants who had kind of seen the world. Um, these migrant uh, returnees had either worked or had gone to colleges in the cities and were not only more technically and commercially savvy, but also better tuned to urban consumer taste. And rural e-commerce provided alternative self-employment opportunities in the comfort of home for those who had grown increasingly dissatisfied with life as you know, part of the floating population of the cities, just my, like my cousin. So the majority of e-commerce businesses run by migrant returnees um, or locals in W Village were family-based. Um, this is uh, still true today, um, although in few Menenders, which I'll you know, talk about later. And the distinction between work and life remains fuzzy. As the logic of family-based small peasant economy met e-commerce flexible regime of accumulation, and in this re new regime of platformized family production, the previously geographically decoupled productive and reproductive labor are somehow relinked in the village home. So um, Wei and his wife Yun uh, were early on the scene. The couple were born in a hamlet near W Village. Um, before moving to W to become full-time e-commerce entrepreneurs in 2007, they had run a small motor um, repair workshop in B County, which is the county seat of W Village, while also selling village-made um, handicrafts on the e-commerce platform Taobao.com in their spare time. So we joined a QQ chat group of a small Taobao sellers and spent much of his time there talking to his fellows. Um, so uh, one day, he opened a uh, link shared by a group member to a motivational speech by Alibaba's now former uh, and very famous CEO, Jack Ma. So the speak, uh, speech was addressed to young people born in the 80s and 90s, we recalled. He told the audience that life is not fair and don't expect society to be equal. How could someone born in a Chinese peasant family compare himself to Bill Gates' son? He said, stop complaining and start your own e-commerce business. E-commerce is the future of the world. Only you can change your own fate. So that weekend, um, can I imagine Jack Ma's words kept playing in Wei's head. After some deliberation, Wei made up his mind to become a full-time e-commerce entrepreneur. And to save on shipping costs and time, he rented a home workshop in uh, W Village. And we compared early days of e-commerce in W to a gold rush. It was really easy back then to sell products on Taobao. You upload a picture and boom, orders start, started to come in. There were so few sellers compared to the rapidly growing number of buyers. The couple actually divided their labor between themselves with way mainly responsible to, um, for um, pr uh, product design, source, uh, sourcing, photography, and e-shop management, and Yun, the wife, doing customer service while taking care of household chores and their son. And inspired by Wei's success, many young villagers in W followed his examples. Um, so this, um, the competitive advantage of rural e-commerce also attracted several young urban knights who felt marginalized in the city. The few uh, urban to rural reverse migrants that I met in W were among actually the most successful entrepreneurs in the village. So uh, Zheng here came from Jinan, which is the capital city of Shandong province. His parents had been workers at a state-owned company. His father recently retired from the company and his mother got laid off a decade ago. Having graduated from a local college with an associate degree in computer science, the then 30-year-old Zheng had dabbled in several small businesses before getting to know W's handicraft products from a college friend in 2007. And a few months later, despite his parents' objection, Zheng relocated to the countryside and rented a small uh, space on W's main street. So here I took a, a quote from him because I thought like it really helped us to understand that people like his situation. He said, my parents were against idea at the beginning, born in the countryside. My dad worked so hard decades ago to get a job in a state-owned company in the city so that I could become an urban knight. But I don't think I have a choice. I tried 
many different things in the city only to realize that the chance of me improving my living standards limited without capital or personal connection. My parents are old retired workers who can't afford to buy me an apartment in G9. Without an apartment and a car, I'm worth little in the marriage market. I had to face reality and pursue a different trajectory if I want to change my fate. And going to the countryside was the right thing at that time. So like many urban migrants I met in um, W Village, rural e-commerce presented Jiang ways an alternative path towards social mobility. When settled in W Village, Jiang's urban background, prior business experience, and also broader social connections give him an advantage over other rural-born entrepreneurs. His Taobao shop quickly became one of the most profitable in the village. And as the scale of his business expanded, he invited his close friend and also a college dorm mate, Jiang, to become his business partner. The partner's rented office or living space attached to a large warehouse in W from the old couple they called godparents, or gan die gan ma in Chinese. The old man was a very powerful and well-respected person in the W village, a former village head. He used, actually, he used his power to rent several strategically located properties owned by the village collective at very low prices. As the handicraft e-commerce industry boomed, the old couple reaped a lot of profits by leasing these properties. And they also opened a handicraft wholesale business themselves. And to better integrate into the lineage-based village society, and Jing, uh, Zheng and Jiang cultivated a cold deal kind of uh, quasi-familial relations with the old couples identifying them as their uh, godparents. So they not only rented their property, but also sourced some of their products from the couple's wholesale business, although you know, these businesses actually often has a higher uh, price. Um, the old couple, in turn, took the young urban knights under their wings, helping them navigate the intricate relationship with villagers and also sometimes local uh, officials. So platformized family production uh, was so prevalent that most of W's e-commerce business was family-based. A hybrid of e-commerce platforms and long traditions of family-based subcontracting system, platformization of familial division of labor uh, took advantage of countryside reserve of so-called reserve army of labor, such as the elderly women and small children, teenager, and also cheap, a cheap office or warehouse rentals, usually you know free uh, family houses, to establish a kind of competitive advantage for rural entrepreneurs and for village-born. Uh, um, entrepreneurs owning a micro family e-commerce business ran from the comfort of home also offered a kind of more flexible, autonomous, and profitable way to make a living, at least in the early days. Even urban reverse migrants um, uh, like Zheng and Jiang had to adapt to this kind of labor regime by forming quasi familial relationships. However, as you'll see, this new regime of hyper uh, production also generates kind of a new tensions. So one such tension is that between the individualized entrepreneur and the collective production um, and politics on the ground. So people familiar with the history of Chinese socialism would um, understand the legacy of model and hero emulating campaigns um, captured by the Mao era slogan, learn from Dajai in agriculture and learn from Daqing in industry. So Dajai is a model village and Daqing an exemplary oil city. Both were kind of celebrated as role models of socialist development. So the making of model villages and heroic individuals exemplify the kind of logic of socialist state society relations. Their state developmental and also redistributed goals intertwined as the Chinese Communist Party's powerful propaganda machine penetrated deeply into the uh, fabric of Chinese rural society. Socialist model making still resonates culturally in a way in post Mao society and persists as a kind of technical party state governance. Alibaba, uh, for example, appropriated and kind of re-energized socialist model making practice to advance its rural platformization campaign by invoking the central government's policy of promoting rural digital entrepreneurship and also coding, uh, courting local sub-provincial governments with the imperative to boost uh, rural economy. So as I documented both in my uh, book and, and 2020 paper, Alibaba's rural campaign was waged on both discursive and technical fronts. 
discursively, Ali Research, uh, which directly served the interests of Alibaba Group as an e-commerce research institute, it was instrumental in kind of weaving together a web of government agencies, state-owned research institutes and universities, media, and also peasant entrepreneurs together to create the so-called Taobao village phenomenon. Uh, initially coined by Ali Research in late 2010, the Taobao village concept reflected Ali Group's strategic rural expansion due to rapidly uh, saturating urban market at that time. So the table on the bottom taken from the same paper maps key events orchestrated by Ali Research to obtain state endorsement of this rural campaign and the impact of its public relations efforts on state policies. Between 2010 and 15, um, Alibaba's lobby materialized in proposals by uh, various parliamentary representatives calling on the Chinese state to spearhead rural e-commerce at annual parliamentary sessions. And this actually led the state to issue a serious document to encourage rural e-commerce. So on the technical front, Alibaba cultivated Taobao villages and peasant entrepreneurs through identification strategies and media management. I learned in my uh, field work that Alibaba's big data team generated visualizations of e-commerce business on this platform by tracking uh, shop owners' IP addresses. Once they identify heavy business concentration in uh, a rural area, um, they would dispatch Alibaba employees um, to cultivate relations with the local municipal township and uh, village governments and peasant shop owners themselves. And to bring visibility to the village, the company would invite journalists from various media outlets to report on village and peasant entrepreneurs. Usually these efforts met with enthusiasm from local cadres, as you can imagine, because um, they promoted tangible political achievements. To attract more peasants to e-commerce, Alibaba often chose peasant representative inside selective um, Taobao Village to become a kind of success story. Uh, more advertising traffic was channeled to the select uh, peasant e-shop by bumping up their product listing rankings and offer them sometimes more opportunities to participate in online promotional activities. So media publicity supplemented algorithmic cherry picking to spread entrepreneur stories for others to emulate. Um, so the company's integration with and also appropriation of socialist mass promotion campaign tactics to energize digital entrepreneurialism also kind of inform the branding story of many of the rural model uh, e-commerce entrepreneurs that I met in the field. They had strategically crafted their brands and self-brands in accordance with not just commercial logic, but also the political demands of um, the, the corporate state nexus. And few more successful than Xiao and Ling, uh, their e-commerce brand, Moon Wan, uh, was in an uh, inexorable from Xiao's own self um, branding as a socially responsible young entrepreneur returned from the city to help his home village modernize and also digitalize the traditional handicraft industry. So a little bit of backstory here. Uh, Xiao's rise to fame started actually in May 2013 uh, when a journalist from Shandong Pro uh, Provincial TV Station's Agriculture Channel came to W to report on the development of village e-commerce in the area. And not, not long after, um, not long after Xiao and Ling's first media profile, a uh, profile, um, Li, uh, Ali Research named W actually as one of China's first batch of um, Taobao villages. Boosted by the village's uh, commercial and political success, Xiao's career as a model e-commerce entrepreneur soon took off. His public image got an important endorsement when the governor of Shandong Province, um, the former actually former governor of Shandong Province, visited the couple's workshop while on the political tour of the village. And in 2014, Xiao was um, actually one of the eight individuals invited by Alibaba to ring the bell at the company's New York Stock Exchange IPO. But unfortunately, he was denied a visa by uh, the U.S. Embassy, so he couldn't go. <laughs> they found a replacement for him, also a, 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 a peasant. Um, from Shanxi. Uh, so the couple's About Us page um, on their e-commerce shop uh, gives an idea of how their branding efforts are linked to, the China, to China's broader political and economic context. Any shopper who opens the page will immediately see their brand's logo. So the company's name juxtaposed with a close-up shop of a pair of worn female uh, hands waving a few tongue. The company's business goals, according to the page, are to Rejuvenate the rural handicraft industry, help absorb rural surplus labor, and promote rural economic development. So the Glossa story served as a backdrop to the kind of public recognition generated by Xiao and Ling's entrepreneurial efforts to digitalize this age-old 
village industry. In the middle of the page, shoppers are presented with three sets of photos and narratives of couples' achievements, including hosting government officials, being interviewed by journalists from media outlets like China Central Television and Russian State TV, and attending national political and commercial events. So taking together, the page tells a kind of a coherent story about Mu Nuan um, and the peasant entrepreneur couple who started it. The, the authenticity of their story instills trust and respect in um, a consumer searching for reliable sellers in the otherwise depersonalized virtual shopping mall. And by purchasing uh, handicraft products from Mu Nuan, uh, urban middle-class uh, shoppers like us can derive a kind of virtual satisfaction from supporting rural rejuvenation and also our peasant brothers and sisters. As for Alibaba, Mu Nuan's brand story, like many other similar narratives of grassroots entrepreneurs entrepreneurs found on the company's um, platforms fosters its corporate image as a champion of grassroots empowerment. And in turn, this corporate brand image all aligns with uh, the Chinese state's latest nation building efforts to promote rural economic and social restructuring through this kind of micro entrepreneurship. So Munai's brand image, uh, like the personal brands of Xiao and Ling, was built around the collective politics of corporate and state backed digitalization. But the, in reality, the couple must carefully navigate the tensions between their individual achievements and their public role as a phase of a collective movement. So as we'll see, the ID-driven um, entrepreneurialization in rural China kind of privileges the individualized e-commerce entrepreneur as, as its ideal subject, and also valorizes intellectual and digital labor by disguising it as IT entrepreneurship. And these tendencies are not only out of step with reality of collective organization of labor within Chinese villages and on, uh, also on e-commerce platforms themselves. But they also occlude the indispensable role of gendered manual labor in the process. So um, the platformization of um, family-based handicraft production and sales promise to quote unquote upgrade industry beyond the export-oriented Shanghai model that we know characterized by fierce competition among small manufacturers to produce low-cost counterfeits or imitations of branded products. In e-commerce village, the reality was actually more complicated. So instead of competing to manufacture brandless, high-quality products at low cost for foreign retailers like Walmart and IKEA, e-commerce entrepreneurs indeed kind of moved up the value chain to design, produce, and sell directly to uh, customers. But, search, but the search ranking of online sales and profit maximizing uh, algorithm of e-commerce like um, Taobao and other apps also discourage, discouraged rural entrepreneurs from actually investing labor and time in designing and testing new products and um, improving the quality of existing products. So as you can see here, the uh, picture on the right hand side compares a branded and non-branded sellers of the basically same handicraft products produced in the same village. That, as you can imagine, the former could be sold at the, uh, the price that doubles uh, the, the latter. Right, so this is all about uh, branding and pho uh, pho photography, um, not really the quality or design of the products. So how Taobao's algorithm encouraged Shenzhen can also be seen in how a baokuan or best-selling product is created on Taobao. A baokuan is born when a product and its many Shenzhen variations becomes almost ubiquitous among consumers across the country, and is sold by numerous online, sometimes offline, Vendors. Because Baokuan drives up search uh, traffic and online sales volume, Alibaba, in, especially in these early days, implicitly encourages the creation of Baokuan products by turning a blind eye to copying by e-sellers listed on these platforms. Taobao's complicated and often adjusting search ranking algorithm and the availability of profit maximizing paid marketing plugins like uh, Zhi Tongche discourage product uh, innovation. So for those of you who don't know, Zhitongche is a pay, pay, paid search ranking system that charges shop owners a click fee to help improve their product uh, listing rankings on Taobao. A uh, village entrepreneur told me that investing money and time in designing and uh, prototyping a new product usually did not commendably reward innovator. It is actually more cost efficient to copy and appropriate existing products, especially Baokuan product designs and redirect the capital saved into Taobao's paid marketing tools to bump up the um, product's um, search ranking uh, results. 
uh, so it's all about you know search ranking traffic or liu liang, right? Uh, so um, even when they have new designs, villagers, entrepreneurs told me that they were you know reluctant to invest capital and resources into research and development for fear that imitators will steal their ideas and profits. And prevalent, a prevalent design copying and proliferation in rural e-commerce reflected broader tensions in platformized social production where distinctions between creativity and copying and also between individualized profiteering uh, and community-based collaboration become muddled. The village-based family production network actually intensified these tensions. Um, although relationships between e-commerce sellers and weavers were sometimes mediated by product collectors in the village. Any e-commerce entrepreneur can choose to source a political product from any weaver in the village. The collective often um, open um, production structure made it easier to steal and copy others' new designs. And absent the legal binding contractual uh, relationship typical of formal business enterprises, village production networks overlap with informal lineage of an agriculture society. So Pei, a rural entrepreneur, explained to me uh, I quote here, I can't keep my design from my cousin and he had to had to tell his wife about it and then his wife's sister knows it too. And in no time you'll see my design listed on every village shop's front page. So among sellers, platform-based market competition works to keep product unit prices low, right? so it's all about price wars. Among e-commerce platform, uh, although e-commerce platform benefits um, by pitting sellers against each other to offer quality products at lower pr uh, prices, um, cutthroat competition has definitely in the process devalued handicraft labor. So um, um, among all the women weavers I met during my field work, um, you know, they were uh, at that time 40 or older and now is I would say uh, the average is kind of 50, 55 by now. Um, as I discussed in another recently published paper that most of the younger women I talked to showed this contempt uh, for women, uh, women under 35, um, dismissing it as physically demanding and culturally inferior to digital labor and ur urban service work. And these pictures show women weavers at work. As you can see, weaving is monotonous and physically arduous. Sitting on a stool, um, the women repeat the kind of same hand motions again and again, most specialized in the standard, in, in the few standardized products. With the industry's growing demand for products and decreasing number of weavers, professional women weavers have to constantly work under time constraints. Their laboring experience are uh, not uh, too different from the kind, uh, very different from the romantic image of rural weavers offered, uh, as, as we just saw, by online branding stories. Uh, online making, uh, 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 handicraft making was also uh, surprisingly poorly paid at a piece rate. A, a skilled female weaver had to work from dawn to dusk seven days a week to earn as much as an average, um, you know, full-time e-commerce customer service girl or supermarket cashier could earn, which was about 500 US dollars per month at that time. The shortage of women weavers already stretches the long-term sustainability of the e-commerce industry. And villagers had been hoping that higher earnings could encourage younger women to stop, uh, to take up weaving again. However, during my um, latest trip to the village in the summer of 2023 last year, I learned how the labor shortage only worsened in the previous five years. Many factors facilitated this shortage, declining birth rates and rising rural living standard, uh, as you can imagine, raised rural families' expectation for uh, children's education. And these, along with the state's policy of small town urbanization and the commodification of rural education and also housing, um, have propelled many villagers to purchase debt financed apartments in the county seat so their, their, their children could attend um, um, county middle schools. So this had significant increased um, the cost of reproductive labor. Um, as you can imagine, um, as these families caught in between the countryside and the small town. Grandmothers in particular are caught up in the actual shift of care work as they shuffle between their children's upper apartments and their old village homes, um, which you know, they continue to hold on to, to take, to take care of their um, you know, school age grandchildren. And some uh, of the grandmas I talked to attempted to continue their weaving activities in urban apartments, but found it rather cumbersome to transport these raw materials and 
products, resulting in challenges in maintaining cleanliness and organization. So I'll show a video of you know, the, the laboring process so that you get a better sense of you know, why it's the case. Um, mothers with school, school age children became also less involved in village-based family income business and more sought alternative career opportunities in the country seat primarily in the service sector. And those who ventured into moving their family income visit to the county seat experienced a sharp rise in cost as they navigated the challenge of renting new offices and hiring employees, um, which this ultimately led many um, you know, to exit the business due to fierce competition in the general economic downturn in the past couple of years. Uh, so I'll show you a video um, of uh, the sort of uh, making a process of making uh, weaving a lab uh, a beam. Oh. 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 Very nice. Very good. Entrepreneur in the village who speaks a little bit of English. Okay. That's all for one. Yeah. That's all for one. Shane Shou, that's all for one. Ah, please. You say Shane Shou, you say Shou, you say Shou. Hi. You say Shou. Okay. 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 So I, I hope this um, story of W Village and rural entrepreneur reinvention has kind of illustrated my approach to digital platforms and algorithms. Instead of treating platformization as a standard universal process with algorithm operating in a social vacuum, I situate them in existing power relations and systems meaning to articulate between the kind of virtual space of platforms and the physical space of community-based production and state society co-evolution. And in doing so, I emphasize the historical continuities and ruptures of platformized labor practice in China within the existing global subcontracting system and family-based gender division labor. I supplement important work on state surveillance in China to show how data and algorithm is also connected to uh, corporate PR, entrepreneurial self-branding, and also state developmental and redistributive initiatives. And rural digital entrepreneurship and platform and family production have indeed provided desirable business and self-employment opportunities to peasants and disadvantaged urbanites, especially I would say prior to the two, uh, mid 2010s. The transformation of W Village highlights the network of state, commercial, and grassroots agents that co-constructed the Taobao Village phenomenon. And my respondents outlined the various appeals of rural e-commerce to peasants, e-commerce platforms, and officials up and down the state apparatus. However, the emergence of digital platforms as new agents of the state and rural digital entrepreneurs as new subjectivity are also, as you already saw, beset with the contradictions inherent to this kind of hybrid regime of labor, which spurred the development of a new regime of value and rural differentiation, um, this time centered on entrepreneurialism. Even as rural e-commerce production has been happed as, you know, um, had been happed, I would say, as a glittering solution to China's restructuring of rural development needs after 2008, the kind of techno uh, uh, entrepreneur optimism for the top of village phenomenon mask and emerging um, commercial political nexus between platforms and local officials, and also obscured contradictions resulting uh, from the specific ways in which rural Chinese peasants were being integrated into the global digital economy. So instead of a magical solution to structural contradictions in the Chinese countryside, the digital reinvention of the existing regime of production and value system has kind of intensified tensions imminent in digital capitalism and in the new entrepreneurial in a regime, a labor regime between individual and collective, between innovation and reproduction, between manual and mental labor. And this is particularly true in rural areas, as we saw where you know, the recent disruption of China's strong collective tradition has been strongly felt, where distinctions between creative, uh, creativity and copying are more contested, 
um, and where manual and labor actually coexist uh, in a specific case in close, in close pro proximity. So the digital economy has definitely minted new winners, but it has also brought together new and pre-existing system of differentiation and inequality. And W Village's varied experience in the new economy remind us of the kind of culturally and especially specific ways that labor regime transformation affects different uh, differentially uh, positioned subjects. So in following China's own historical trajectory, um, the story of the e-commerce village, like the other two stories that I told in the book, could be read, I hope, as a kind of supplement, if not a modest counterbalance to proliferating accounts of China in Western English speaking world that produced since late 2010s uh, that kind of examine China from Western perspectives. As I ha had shown in the story of W and throughout the book, China did change significantly after it had rejoined the capitalist world system in the 70s, actually under heavy American influence. And in many aspects, such as advancing financialization, platformization, and promoting ID entrepreneurship, China had closely followed American footsteps. However, in the spirit of entrepreneur reinvention, uh, China had also pursued a distinct trajectory that builds on its traditions and its condition at the same time by its geographical limitations and also changing positions in the global capitalist um, world order. China's post-2008 reinvention has been mainly propelled by a desire, if not an anxiety, I would say, to overcome its own structural problems and contradictions resulted from you know, um, four decades of integration into the global um, capitalist division of labor. So the problems faced by China at the current conjuncture are not its alone. Decades of financialized global capitalism uh, had wreaked havoc on national economies around the world. And this is the context in which entrepreneurialism prevailed amid weak labor protection, high inequality, and debt financed economic bubbles uh, that we continue to see today. And China's post 2008 entrepreneur reinvention, though building on its own imperial, revolutionary, and socialist traditions and continuing from its distinct developmental trajectories in the previous decades, is a kind of spatial specific manifestation of a global shift where national economies uh, in its attempt to you know, uh, overcome global risk and economic instability are becoming, to borrow a concept from uh, late Karl Polini, kind of re-embedded into state and family institutions. So by uh, 2021, over a decade after my per uh, cousin's personal reinvention from a factory laborer into a digital entrepreneur, the number of gig workers of all types in China had exploded, like, like many other places in the world. Um, as the gig workers expand, uh, workforce expanded, the side of labor struggles also shifted from industrial factories to include workers on digital platforms. So since then, the state actually launched a re-regulation campaign that we all know, targeting big tech companies like Alibaba, who is still kind of going through restructuring at this moment, with measures ranging from, ranging from antitrust company restructuring, reducing financial risk, and issuing guidelines protecting the rights of platform gig workers. And on coincidentally, similar antitrust and labor protection measures are being proposed and implemented around the world, from the EU's Digital Service Act to American Labor um, Department's proposal to classify more gig workers as employees and not independent contractors and other uh, acts in the US like Build Back Better and Re Inflation Reduction Acts. And these and other national policy around the world has prompted predictions about the end of quote unquote era of small government and unlimited globalization. So at a time of heightened global ge um, geopolitical tensions and rising domestic discontents towards, uh, among many other things, inflation in the US and high uh, unemployment, especially youth unemployment in China, how to strike a balance between kind of re restoring domestic equity and maintaining decent economic growth and the need to kind of defend national security and state competitive innovation is a challenge that you know, many countries face at this moment. Oops. Um, how do I go back to kind of... Um, This one, the slide. Sorry. Okay, so I'm nearing my end of time. 
Um, so last summer, as I, as I made it back to um, China for fieldwork research af after almost four decades of pandemic-induced isolation, I learned how the state's re-regulation uh, campaign targeting pig tax Tax, coupled with a prolonged zero COVID control and the fall of the real estate market more recently has exerted a mixed impact, definitely a mixed impact on e-commerce and its practitioners around the country. But the industry itself, especially rural e-commerce, um, like entrepreneurial labor, uh, I would say continue to play a crucial role amid a general economic downturn and high use only employment in China as the country kind of attempts to reinvent itself again post pandemic. So from expanding overseas to seek new markets uh, to uh, resources and labor force to continue reshaping of rural China agriculture and rural urban relations, China is seeking um, and building new external and uh, internal drivers for economic recovery at, and development at this moment. So one of my missions of this year, which happens to be my research sabbat sabbatical year, is to continue to capture through field work these transformations from the intersecting side of rural China media technologies. As the China uh, paradigm continues to evolve, the nature of the new paths that will you know, emerge for China remains uncertain, but it's sure to have significant implications for the future of Asia and the world. Uh, so uh, as a critical scholar of media technologies, I was often told by my friend that I have a tendency to be really pessimistic about things. So I would like to end the presentation with a short video uh, shared by my informants, actually the same guy uh, who's tried to speak a little bit of English in the previous video you saw. Um, shared by him a few years ago, um, I have to admit that I'm always impressed by the entrepreneur resilience and optimism of my uh, informants and their courage to face up to challenges despite structural constraints. Um, and then, you know, I'll stop and hear your comments. Everybody, it's my office. Actually, Customer service guy he hired. better now like he has a kind of updated version of office that's from um seven years ago i believe okay so yeah thank you <laughs> thank you so much lynn that is uh very solid and amazingly rich so let me maybe distract you for 30 seconds and uh, you can take a break breath and uh, prepare your questions yeah, so uh, yes, you spotted. I forgot to introduce myself. So I am a moderator assigned by Tencent, and uh, I'm the menu operator of the slideshow today, assigned by Lin. And last and the least, uh, I'm assistant professor in interactive media business uh, at NYU Shanghai. My name is Jing Wang. Um, yeah, so Lin and I know, uh, know each other for more than 11 years, yeah. Um, so in our, in a, this kind of uh, our friend circle of uh, this um, uh, Chinese communication scholars, Lin is known as kind of a sort of a tornado scholar. So she speaks very fast and always present her research very coherently, uh, very uh, smoothly and persuasively. And that you want really want to follow her argument, even if you don't really fully understand it. Yeah. So I think it's a time. It's a time to uh, really flesh out uh, all those um, uh, questions and uh, uh, the the stories and the cases and also theoretical contributions that you are interested in. And uh, um, so for those uh, participants, join us from Zoom. I would recommend you to put down your question in the chat and then I will uh, just uh, um, uh, read the questions on your behalf. Yeah, so now, now let's open the floor for the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have questions here. Do we need a Mac? 
Or you, you can talk to yourself. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Zhang. Thank you so much for um, sharing. Um, I just have a question. Why did you choose W Village as your main field? And how typical do you think? Because you gave us the data, how many Taobao villages across China, and we all know how different um, uh, China can be right. uh, depending on the region. So I want to understand yeah. how uh, the W Village itself, how it relates to your argument and how typical and how, yeah. what, what are the differences might be in other regions? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, it's also, I think it's a very classic question that ethnographer would uh, struggle with, right? So you always want to balance the depths with um, the breadth, right? And, uh, um, and you know, traditional uh, anthropologists would just focus on one village, right? And is trapped from that. And for my case, I, I definitely try to kind of if you read the chapters, um, I try to uh, give people a bigger uh, picture and the history of not just Taobao villages, but also um, rural uh, development through digital technologies and situate Taobao, this particular village, inside uh, that broader context. And uh, for reasons uh, for choosing uh, this W village is, um, I actually visited, um, I would say, at least five um, Taobao villages in many different parts of, of this, uh, the, uh, the country, um, it, 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 especially in you know, the Zhejiang area where it's uh, initially uh, originated and also in, um, and in, in Hebei and also in uh, Yunnan more recently and in, um, in, in Chengdu as I expand uh, westward, also with the same question of how typical this is, right? So um, I would say uh, there are many different types of Taobao village and this particular one, I think, definitely kind of more kind of preserve the kind of traditional village structure, whereas the one in uh, another famous one, Qingyan Liu in um, uh, Yi Wu is, is more like a, 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 a more kind of structure, right? And most of the village, uh, Entrepreneurs are actually not returnees, but uh, entrepreneurs from you know over the uh, country, even you know from other parts of the world, going uh, there to, to become traders. And then uh, you know, uh, so it's a, it's not a typical kind of a traditional um, fam uh, rural family uh, structure in that regard. Um, and also in terms of um, products, right? So um, this a particular. Uh, Taobao village also makes its products, which some village, I would say a good number of that uh, villages are like that, but there are other villages actually like Qingyan Liu actually source products from the uh, nearby um, uh, uh, wholesale market, right? So that's another structure. And also increasingly, I, uh, what I see is a lot of villages also sell uh, these days with, you know, the kind of um, uh, coaching technology uh, being matured, uh, fresh vegetables and fru uh, uh, fruits um, and uh, um, farm produce, right? Uh, so, um, you know, also in various the kind of products itself. And um, um, in addition to that, I would say um, uh, another focus um, uh, is um, state society relations and, you know, uh, with um, relations with local government. It also varies, as you can imagine. In the, uh, 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 the Yangtze River Delta region, it's definitely more entrepreneurial. The government's more entrepreneurial. And in the village I presented, I think it's more kind of politics centered. And Western China and Middle China is also a different story. So that's actually, you know, my. Um, one of the missions of my news trip is, uh, you know, journey it um, uh, more extensively to other Taobao villages and also in collaboration with other scholars who also work on other e-commerce villages to try to develop uh, kind of uh, more, I would say, um, you know, uh, 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 kind of extensive theories uh, to extrapolate from the very experience of all these cases. So I think this is a kind of beginning of 
um, uh, the, the study, although, you know, the Taba village, the concept of name is kind of winning, but definitely rural e-commerce um, and also with kind of rural in agriculture and transformation that this kind of uh, phenomenon of selling um, agricultural products and also digitalizing rural or countryside are still, you know, uh, rapidly unfolding, right? So, um, so that's just the beginning of my <laughs> work. I'm actually doing more comparative works at this moment to, you know, see um, if, if there's anything larger and more uh, theoretically uh, kind of sophisticated that we could extrapolate from all these different cases. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I have a ethnographic question. Thank you so much for your talk. I find the part on Shanzhai production especially oh. um, interesting. So. I gather that um, sometimes the mm. innovator and the copycat can live in the same village. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they're neighbors sometimes. They're you know, right. uh, even so, so relatives. That, that creates very interesting tension. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it ever escalates into interpersonal feuds mm. or do they report each other on the mm. platform, mm. kind of a leave a market problem to a market solution scenario? Uh, very common. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of friendships, um, you know, broken or even, you know, <laughs> relatives, um, bad familial relations broken in the process. Um, and uh, I, I, th I, I think, and, and also this is not a long, like a lot of new thing, right? So because Shenzhen and also this kind of export oriented price war based production has been in China and elsewhere you know, developing regions for, for a long time. So um, it's, it's, it's not uh, a surprise, um, but uh, uh, definitely I think e-commerce in a way intensify that because um, the platforms uh, give you a uh, ranking, right? So you know which ones to copy very direct and you just see which one sells best. Um, whereas, you know, if you are doing subcontracting work for, um, you know, some other brands based um, um, abroad, it's uh, usually it's, it's several layers of, of opinions for you to overcome in order to understand, right? So, so definitely this, um, I think, transformed the social relations in the village. And I think one of the responses I received from uh, the ground when I asked villagers, you know, what is the biggest change you feel? after you would return or, you know, after e-commerce came and they said, they told me, oh, it's not the same village anymore, right? People all stay at home, work on Taobao, or they uh, sometimes they try to hide uh, their, you know, uh, secret, secret sauce of their business. And it's, it's, it's definitely a different kind of village that we are returning to, right? So, um, yeah, so I think that uh, um, definitely it transformed uh, the social relations, although made some people rich, uh, but also made it uh, a kind of a more, uh, the countryside a more competitive environment, engage in, you know, production of uh, same or similar um, products. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this stimulating talk. I have two broader questions. So the stories that you showed, uh, you presented, show how the state and the platform collaborated very well to pr to practice neoliberalism, mm -hmm. such as to promote the model Taobao Vintage and to promote brand model peasants. I'm curious about whether there is any tension between the state and the platforms in those neoliberal practices, uh, especially in the rural context. Hmm. So my second question is based on your book structure because you structure the book uh, as the city versus village because it seems to me that the uh, entrepreneurship practices in, in rural areas are well accepted by the state. I wonder whether the state show different attitudes toward the entrepreneurship practices in urban areas and the rural areas such as the cases between Zhongguanzun versus uh, the Taobao village. Hmm. So I don't know um, yeah, yeah. if you could say more about the difference. Yeah, very good. Right, so definitely tensions, um, especially I think since the book was uh, published last year and most of your work was done, uh, you know, at least five years ago, right? So, and we, uh, you know, even news we witnessed the tensions um, um, and um, especially on the central government level between platforms, um, 
um, and you know how the, the government uh, tried to attempt to re-regulate these platforms, and that um, you know in a sort of a bureaucratic uh, kind of still I would say Leninist structure of Chinese bureaucracy, and these signals would send down to the countryside, to you know county level, even village level countries, and instead of what I saw in the field, 2015, 16, 17, even you know leading up to. Um, I would say even during the pandemic, this kind of competition for opportunities brought about by these private, you know, um, usually um, foreign, uh, you know, uh, New, New York Stock Exchange listed companies like uh, Alibaba and Pinduoduo, and now it's a kind of refrain uh, from uh, these kind of practices and more um, thinking about, you know, establishing a sort of uh, local or government uh, sponsored um, um, platforms, right, or big data, sort of, um, and I think data is a big issue that, you know, the government doesn't want these data to get out of China and, you know, for data security purposes, right, so you, you definitely see a shift in attitudes, but I, 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 I as, I, as I said, it's an unfinished experiment, right, so I, I think the state also get a signal that the kind of re-regulation um, helps a little bit in kind of re-regulating uh, re or disciplining the kind of um, runaway market, but it also um, you know, leads to other problems, right? So, and I wouldn't say like state uh, re-regulation is the only problem, right? So we have a compounded global issue at this time in this um, economic downturn that we are facing at this moment is very complicated, but definitely I think you, you saw, you know, uh, starting from, um, I would say probably uh, latter half of 2022 and 2003, early 2003, the state shifts of attitudes and, you know, <laughs> you know, going back to talk about uh, entrepreneurship and, you know, supporting private businesses. But that uh, is very hard to reverse uh, the lack of, uh, you know, small uh, or, you know, not just small, but big capitals confidence in the Chinese market at this moment. So I think the Chinese state is trying to navigate what in um, another of my paper, um, you know, try to uh, map up this kind of pendulum swing between, you know, show and fun or control and, um, and, and kind of more, more, more lessen, lessen the control in order to promote development. And then this, this cycle of internal swing also intersects with, at this moment, increasingly because China is so inter, uh, interconnected, integrated financially into the global market, the geopolitics, right? So I think that really sort of, it's, it's a very kind of complex network that we are analyzing here. And what I try to do is I don't want to present a dichotomous state versus market uh, model um, and instead try to really historicize and make it concrete, right? Not just the central level, but also how central level interact with local level in shaping, you know, um, economic practices on the ground. And the second question, remind me of this. Oh, right, right, yeah, definitely different. I think Zhong Guanchun and this particular case, um, just, uh, you know, due to time constraint, I would name one big difference. I think for Zhong Guanchun, the state see it more as um, a um, force to um, maintain, you know, national security to, um, uh, 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 or, or um, uh, uh, technological independence. Right, so uh, entrepreneurship and innovation in Zhong Guanchun, whereas in Taobao, in, in rural China, is more about equity, right? So um, I, I think um, so that you know, uh, security, uh, development, equity is the sort of triangle that I map out in the book. Um, you know, after uh, Professor Lin Chun uh, from LLC, his her model of you know China's um, state society. Uh, relations uh, that I think, um, you know, entrepreneurship is used, or especially digital related entrepreneurship and innovation to use as a kind of silver bullet to address all these problems at the same time. But what you'll see on the field is in each of the sites, it manifested the tensions, right, between equity and development. And I would say that in Dong Wanchun, definitely, Dong Wanchun's mission of entrepreneurship is more about, you know, spearheading. Uh, semiconductor in, in, independence, whereas Taobao Village is more about providing employment 
and a kind of more kind of reserved army of you know um, protecting China from the sort of um, risk of the uh, of the uh, 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 the the, the um, the external uh, circuits of the economy and more kind of internal, what we call like now internal circuits of the economy, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna go for it first. Hi, fantastic talk. Thank you so much for sharing your wonderful research with us. And I was actually, um, like, you know, I really appreciate your scalar analysis. So like, you know, going from the village to the New York Stock Exchange and that, you know, the story of that one person who's actually denied the visa is very interesting to me because mm. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if maybe I should answer the last question, the second question first, since is, I don't know, since I, I, I returned um, from the U.S. to China, um, you know, uh, in, in um, this time, in a bit right before the Chinese New Year holiday, and I stayed with my parents for a few months, and, you know, I've been kind of um, doing field work. In, in, in Shandong provinces again, and also, um, you know, reading all the news, um, online discussions, I felt like it's for um, many years, and I, th <laughs> I feel like this is a different time, right? So I kept, um, for, for almost a decade, uh, more than a decade, I kept returning to China. Each time I feel like, um, you know, uh, people are getting richer and very hopeful. And I feel, um, you know, and but I feel like this this time, um, the China is going through a lot of challenges at the, 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 at the time. So I, I really think that the Chinese economy has a lot of potentials, and that a lot of the potentials are already embedded into, um, you know, the system and the people. And um, so <laughs> I, I I don't want to perpetuate a kind of. Uh, uh, pessimism, especially young people feel at this moment, <laughs> um, and, and and so um, so I I decided to show a more to 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 try to live on a more optimistic note to show people that we've seen you know we life is better this <laughs> is actually you know like we we've seen worse right so we can um, you know overcome this challenge. Um, and even, you know, we made it from, from the past days to today and things are, uh, you know, improved. So um, there's still hope. And regarding your first question about transformation, it's a very complicated question, depending on um, which spatial aspect you are talking about, right? And depending on villages are different, different. Um, those that produce, farm produce, um, you know, and those that are, you um, um, produce the kind of kind of um, um, uh, industrial products that I mapped in this village uh, are quite different. I would say, um, in terms of how, well, after e-commerce entered, uh, for many of the successful 
um, um, Taobao villages, uh, you uh, you see a lot of inflow of either returnees or um, uh, reverse migrants, right? So that definitely changed um, the structure of um, the uh, the the um, the, fat, the the village. You'll see a lot of you know, uh, newer, uh, shine, shiny uh, buildings being rebuilt and a, a lot of the spaces being rented out. And in a particular village for, you know, the peak of the business, I would say in 2020, 19, there were uh, 15, 15 uh, delivery company stations just inside the village, actually more than in the county seat, because that's the top of it where, you know, all the, all the transportation and traffics are going, right? So, and, and then and also, you know, this kind of platform dependent uh, work, including delivery, you know, and other kind of uh, uh, business bringing new people and you know, tr car cars, trucks. Um, and also what's interesting, I also mapped out in the book is um, the construction of um, the state sponsor, government sponsor construction of all these, new uh, so-called uh, innovation um, clusters or buildings similar to actually Zhong Wanchun. Surprisingly, you know, like when Zhong Wanchun was building all these co-working co co spaces and you could, you could, you incubators, you'll see that even in the village and um, part of a uh, driven part, uh, part of, uh, also partially by the kind of real estate boom that's kind of um, consolidated also on the county level, right? On the county and village level, which are largely left empty at this moment, right? So there's an overcapacity of over construction. And you'll see all these countries really trying to move all these entrepreneurs into these new, you know, really beautiful, shining business uh, structures, exhibition centers and things like that. But, you know, for, uh, the entrepreneurs, right? So it's uh, more cost efficient, as I mentioned, to stay using their family space. But a lot of them, as I mentioned in the past five years, are uh, moving to the county seat uh, because of the sort of facilitated urbanization process that relocated a lot of uh, uh, people, um, peasants, um, you know, uh, farmers uh, into uh, county, county, um, county apartments, right? <laughs> I hope that kind of addressed a little bit of your question, but it's a very complicated question. You can write, you know, papers or books on that, just a transformation of space. Yeah, so we actually got a question from the Zoom participant. Um, so hi, Dr. Zhang. Thank you so much for your wonderful work, wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about the boundaries between entrepreneurs and workers slash laborers. It seems that in your case, this boundary is more and more ambiguous. Uh, would you mind sharing more insights on this? Thank you. And this is a question from uh, Yilin uh, Li. Yeah, so definitely. Uh, so uh, that is one of my uh, theoretical bases. And I'm not the first person to uh, coin the concept of entrepreneurial labor, right? So before me, sociologist, um, and already have been discussing um, entrepreneurial labor, right? So, um, and I, 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 in my particular case, um, in the three sides or the three stories I try to tell in the book, uh, we see the, the lines, the boundaries between entrepreneurship and labor are all blurring. And, um, and, 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 and so I think entrepreneurs uh, become the new types of laborers and not just in, on the grassroots in the you know uh, working class uh, level, uh, like e-commerce uh, sellers in the countryside or uh, delivery workers, but also uh, on the middle class level, right? So even professors nowadays has to be enterprising and entrepreneurial, right? You have to have a website, you have to be able to brand yourself. Right? So I think, uh, and then I'll, I'm, I'm also a wage worker of a you know, public institution in the US. I, I do feel I'm also kind of entrepreneurial labor in that regard. I feel like, uh, I think I, I'm, what I'm trying to capture uh, through this kind of fuzzy, fuzzy concept is a kind of sentiment, right? Uh, and of the, the, the era that we all feel uh, that we're entrepreneur of, of some sort and uh, tech technology, especially platforms um, are kind of definitely facilitating this transformation. Uh, 
thank you for the talk uh, and thank you to Wang Jing for inviting you to NYU Shanghai. I think uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, what you have written and uh, uh, presented today uh, at NYU Shanghai. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, issue of ideology um, mm. Um I think uh, we are going from socialism to communism in this country. Um, and, and where does this fit um, with regard to discourse about socialism in China uh, today and um, e-commerce, entrepreneurship? Is there discourse taking place among the Marxist uh, schools or not about how do you ideologically think of this changes that's taking place, not only with regard to commerce, but especially with regard to labor, right? Mm -hmm. So is there a theoretical, ideological discourse that's taking place? Uh, the tension that Benson was, Benson was mentioning was mm -hmm. is a structural, but there's a tension, ideological tension, right? That seems to have started since 1978, mm. uh, right? I mean, capitalist economy, but mm. socialist country, right? Mm. So now that we have reached this point, a type a Taoizeization of China, um, what is the ideological take on all this? Do we have literature, or have you looked at the literature about how the socialist system is trying to deal with these issues? Are there people who are thinking about it? how to bring all this together, or is this part of getting rid of capitalism at some point uh, and, and creating a communist country? I mean, where is the ideological framing of, of what China is today? That's a very sophisticated and complicated question. Yeah, let's see if I can address this. Um, so, I think depending on the side, so I picked, the side I picked, I would say it's a side is that is more kind of integrated into the um, neoliberal capitalist uh, practices, right? Uh, whereas if, if I were to study collective um, villages, which I'm actually working on now, like I visited several, uh, um, what they call dangban, uh, like uh, part, party led collectives um, in, in the countryside, right? So I feel like that discourse really was on the rise in the past five years, right? I, I feel like partially as a response to the kind of uh, what I think the party states perceive as a runaway uh, yeah. neoliberalization. Uh, even you know on the on, in the countryside in the uh, throughout uh, since two thousand eight, so um, and um, but I don't think even you know like I I saw even more contradictions <laughs> in these collectives than the top uh, top of village and you know uh, the interviews I did uh, uh, the the um, the cadres on the on the local level um, you know going through study sessions and they have a lot of kind of contradictions in their mind between the practice and um, what, um, you know, um, the kind of, they, they're also experimenting in a way, right? So um, I would say, I, I don't think China is returning to a kind of, uh, I don't know, like a preset model of socialism or communism, right? And um, it, for me, it's hard to for me to say. I wouldn't say. I definitely wouldn't say China is communist now, <laughs> and I would say China is definitely capitalist, <laughs> but not um, capitalist in the sense that the U.S. is and a different capitalist. Um, you know, I, th that's why I think the, uh, the 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 paradigm, the China paradigm concept, is useful in a way, and and also you know. Um, in depending on where in China you are talking about, which case you are focusing on, right? So I see a lot of experiments going on at this moment if we are just to focus on the rural side. And um, uh, for example, I mentioned the collective um, experiment. Um, I, I think the the role of the platforms, especially like Alibaba, even you know, Pinduoduo, Douyin are downplayed. 
um, and in at least in on paper, right? And the role of local countries, local governments, um, and sort of ideological uh, leadership are uh, uh, trumped up um, more prominently. So I think that's sort of um, contentious forces are uh, competing with each other in, you know, um, taking China into a new direction. But I, I do think at this moment, the biggest challenge is um, lack of uh, uh, economic confidence, whether in consumption or in investment, right? So in that way, um, that's why I'm saying that there's no way for China to return to the <laughs> previous kind of decoupled, more integrated, um, more more disintegrated model of socialist development in relative isolation from the capitalist world, right? And now China has become so integrated. And uh, what it can do, I think, at best is to sort of, um, you know, tap into some of the resources, some of the um, legacies um, in its own governance toolkits. Um, you know, not just social toolkits, but also sometimes traditional governance toolkits and kind of reinvent that and combine that and adapt that, keep adapting to um, the pace of capital society. I, I might be, I don't know, in that regard, I might be, a, um, you know, a more of a prag pragmatist in that regard, right? So if, when, you know, as an ethnographer, observing all these uh, practices on the ground, um, and I, I, I think there will always be contradictions. And for me, it will always be, um, you know, um, uh, practices, uh, ongoing practices that's, you know, a bundle of hybrids instead of you know, pure socialism or pure capitalism. So that's, but, but definitely I think the direction it is going is shaped by uh, larger contexts, especially geopolitics at this moment. If I could push you on a little bit more, it's not going back. I mean, the idea is creating a Xiao Kang society, mm. right? That's mm. the forward looking, right? Mm -hmm. In this creation of Xiao Kang, where does this fit? Mm. And definitely, uh, the I think in general, um, GDP per, pat, uh, per, per, per capita GDP is improving. Um, but also at the same time, you witness um, different sort of inequalities emerging, right? So, um, so I think you you um, you 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 see kind of uh, le le collectively uh, level up, right? But at the same time, it's new differentiations. So in that regard, I would say um, it's not the ideal version of common prosperity <laughs> that you you want in these villages, but um, uh, but if you talk to um, the um, these people, depending on who you are talking to, right? So they definitely um, would welcome, um, you know, relative uh, prosperity in comparison to poverty, <laughs> right? Uh, but I wouldn't deny that uh, you know uh, there are new forms of inequalities emerging, and I I do think. Uh, uh, um, the state is trying to, in some way, to uh, address these problems, but sometimes not as effective, um, especially in the kind of general um, economic term term, because the state has to rely on these same tools, like platforms, like private companies that generate inequality to drive the economy forward, right? So that tension between development and equity will always be there. And I think it's, about you know maintaining this balance. <laughs> mm. Questions? Uh, I yeah, I had one question, but now uh, inspired, in, stimulated by uh, Tencent's question, I had two. Yeah. So then, uh, to follow up on Tencent's question, I think, uh, do you think um, the corporate, um, those companies? Um, did play a role hmm. uh, in um, kind of this poverty lift uh, uh -huh. campaign initiated by the by the government. 
Um, or do you think, to what extent do you think this kind of role is highly performative, mm. uh, largely driven by um, business uh, or profit mm. rather than um, the kind of ideological mm. address of collective mm. prosperity? Mm. Yeah, so that's the first question. And then the second question is about your second uh, project, uh, which is on biotech. Yeah, so since uh, we have a, a, a lot of young scholars here, include myself, so I wonder if you could uh, maybe show us more, uh, maybe disclose a bit about your intellectual trajectory. Mm. So how do you, how did you identify this topic mm. for your second book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, do you see any connections <laughs> between this um, uh, entrepreneur in Chinese uh, new digital economy mm. and the uh, biotech uh, project. Yeah. Yeah, for the first question, it's a good question. It's also a question that I try to explore in my current work. I, I definitely agree that they, even like being profit driven, they're a uh, public listed company, their responsibilities is to generate profits, right? So I think definitely, um, uh, you know, even in the process of um, generating profits, um, uh, they did some work, indeed, indeed some work uh, on, on in improving the uh, lives, a living standard of uh, people on the ground and transform the economy into a different shape, right? Um, also, you know, generated contradiction at the same time. And, and I agree with you in the sense that a lot of these are highly performative. And I think that's partially why we hear uh, few words and few were about, I, I feel like that, um, efforts to really, um, you know, uh, subcontract in a way, you know, uh, sort of uh, all those responsibilities of power trade reduction to private businesses really peaked uh, a couple of years ago. I think what government is thinking now is to rely on more on state-owned enterprises and, you know, um, uh, and, and, and the government bureaucracy to drive the efforts. Because I think that kind of tension between profit, especially if it's, you are a New York Stock Exchange listed company and between you know all these um, other actual economic um, tasks are um, almost impossible to resolve, right? So I think that's why you'll see that kind of experiment is kind of hitting, hitting a wall in a way, right? Um, and um, regarding our second question, um, so um, so basically, um, if you see the structure of my book, um, the um, first two chapters, uh, so the five chapters, first two major chapters uh, focus on more kind of the urban-based innovation um, uh, system, and the uh, the latter three chapters is kind of a more micro platform. Um, rural, um, especially these two chapters, uh, rural-based practices. So that is uh, sort of, it's, it's not an easy process to write this kind of really many-sided ethnographic book. Um, uh, but I think what um, uh, the, I wouldn't say benefit, but it complicates my research trajectory in a way that on one hand, I'm, this got me really interested in the, the sort of, um, 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 urban-centered um, um, innovation practices uh, like semiconductor and biotech, for example, um, and also considering my uh, location uh, in, in uh, my universities, for those of you who don't know, it's located near Boston. It's one hour drive from Boston. So a lot of my friends are actually um, involved in the um, biotech sector, right? So it's kind of a natural continuation from the two chapters of Zhong Wanzun, and I met a lot of biotech entrepreneurs um, in Zhong Wanzun during that time who are transnational, who, you know, um, I, you know, when I returned to Boston, I met them there as well. So I figured this would be an interesting thread uh, to kind of continue my previous, um, 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 uh, previous uh, exploration into the sort of, um, the, the, the urban-centered innovation of what China is considered very important at this moment, indigenous innovation, and also, you know, migration, issue of immigration, attracting of um, a scientific talent uh, from the U.S. and other, you know, many other uh, places back to China. And, you know, a lot of people also returned or left, 
during the COVID lockdown. So this kind of migration practice itself is uh, also interesting to you know um, uh, document. Um, so that is one line of research. The other lines continue from the rural chapter, um, sort of uh, going deeper into the uh, and continue with um, to to see new practices, new experiments on the ground. Right. Um, so, and and it's definitely a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I can, you know, um, you know, slowly and, and gradually, um, you know, deliver my promises to myself. But definitely, you know, uh, scholarly career is 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 un un unfinished, right? It's always unfinished projects, and uh, and I'm always driven by my curiosity and to understand you know, uh, historically, in a sense, what is conjuncturally significant, right? <laughs> is it working? Oh, okay, thank you for the fascinating talk. I have a question about uh, the role of children in family mm. productions. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit more mm. on um, basically children. So I can, uh. you, you talked about the increase in the cost of reproductive labor. So I'm also wondering if you have ever encountered any examples, cases of children contributing to entrepreneurial mm. labor mm. or is entrepreneurial labor mm. and adult labor only? Mm. And I was basically, how do children complicate the, um, the family production, the, the unit of family as a site of production and reproduction? Yeah, definitely. I think um, teenagers, I do see teenagers offering a helping hand to their parents. Um, but, um, uh, but increasingly, I think uh, rural Chinese are more like increasingly becoming like urban Chinese now. And, and especially in the particular uh, areas that in Shandong, a lot of pressure to, you know, um, um, get higher grade in the college ex uh, entrance exam, right? So um, I think, um, you know, m the the ambition of these parents is uh, they become, you know, once they become richer, they would invest more resources into um, helping the children, um, you know, so that they are not stuck in the countryside or become a working class migrant worker, right? So to clamp up through, to clamp up the education ladder in a way. So I don't see a lot of um, efforts in you know, trying to get the children into <laughs> laboring, but rather uh, to save up for them and to buy them a county apartment, go to better schools uh, so that they can, you know, uh, in a way, um, become urbanized. <laughs> I think that's that's my my feeling, and um, um, and a lot of the returnees, um, right? So so um, and it and and yeah, so yeah, I I, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a different situation. I think even that uh, one one decade ago, you'll see a lot of more rural children participating in this kind of family business. And nowadays, especially in, in Shandong, more investment into, uh, you know, um, them achieving better results in, in the sort of education realm. Yeah. A lot of extra curriculum classes as well. And some of them even hired foreign teachers to practice English <laughs> learn recently. So really. Uh, Thank you for uh, your interest in my work. Am I audible? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your fantastic talk. I just have one uh, small question. What do you think of uh, entrepreneurial labor in terms of gender groups? And what's the difference of uh, like between uh, women as uh, labor and the men as labor from your perspective, especially in the case of rural e-commerce? Mm. And what do you think of, uh, you know, the uh, role of the ladies, especially the lady, beautiful ladies, would go it okay, appeared in the doing uh -huh. product selling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Thank you. 
Right, so I wasn't able to address that in the presentation, uh, but it's showing up in my latest work that um, you know, now is more about live streaming, right? Uh, so uh, it's, I would say it's a slightly different type of um, labor practices uh, than traditional e-commerce, which put more emphasis on you know, whether you are presentable, right? whether you're funny, um, you know, more on sort of appearance and, you know, um, self, uh, personal pre uh, presentation. Um, so, um, and definitely, um, and, 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 it, and it's, as you, you sharply observed, it's also a gendered experience, right? Um, and definitely uh, focusing, for women, focusing more on the appearance. But also you'll see even in live streaming or some of the short videos, the different type of genres and some would feature, I don't know, like really earthy <laughs> or um, rural uh, grounded, um, you know, village girls with you know, sometimes uh, North Eastern dialects, right? So there are different types of genres. You don't necessarily have to be, you know, physically attractive and you can create all, your own market niche in that realm. Um, and, but I, I, ha I have to say that definitely, I feel like still you see, even in this kind of more flexible practice of labor, the um, secondary, the actual shift of reproductive labor being, overly, uh, um, you know, um, uh, placed on women. And right? so even, you know, the, um, the, 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 the guys and uh, the women are all in the same family space now. Um, and reproductive labor, uh, caretaking, um, you know, is mostly, uh, mostly still falls on, on the women. Um, and, and, and also, um, I think the intersectional angle there is very important because, with the age difference, right? Um, I, I think um, following anthropologist Yunxiang, Ye Yunxiang's work, I do observe a kind of descending feminism in a way that younger people have more power, um, older guys <laughs> and women are uh, in a way that, um, you know, because of the declining birth rate, right? They pin a lot of hope and invest a lot of resources into the younger, the children, the child, sometimes it's only child, sometimes it's two, um, you know, uh, seldom more than that, even in the countryside um, these days, um, you know, in, in educating, in uh, uh, cultivating the perfect uh, child. Uh, in, in, unfortunately, in rural China, it's the same, same pressure. Um, right, so I think um, gender intersects with um, age there in sort of reshaping the um, family kind of power relationship dynamics in the countryside. Yeah. Thank you. That's a much desired tornado uh, bringing uh, a lot of fresh air, I would say. Um, yeah, so um, may I invite Dr. Sen to conclude uh, today's keynote speech session? <laughs>